Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, so now we've got a talk on tutorial de driven development by Christopher Woods from the University of Bristol. Let's go ahead. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Brilliant start. I hope you could keep this energy going throughout the thing because if we take the subtitle, what it is, how it works and why it is great, exclamation mark, I am going for you leaving this talk thinking that was a well-deserved exclamation mark. You know, I want hands up at the end, was I right to include it? So let's set the scene. Let's go back. It is March 2020. We have a valiant team of epidemiologists. Watch them wiggle. There they are working day and night with their piece of software, MetaWards. Off it goes. And they're using it to make projections of how COVID is going to spread throughout the UK. Now, at this time, as you probably many of you remember, there were big questions as to the validity, the reproducibility, the robustness of the software, which was underpinning all of these projections. And so we, in the Bristol RSE group, we also wiggle, we were brought in to look at the code and help improve the robustness. At the same time, a group of uncertainty quantification statisticians at Exeter in the UK for COVID project, UQ for COVID project, they were brought in to look at the statistical uncertainties and the validity of the predictions which were coming out. Now, the purpose of this collaboration was fourfold. First, it was to improve the robustness and the reproducibility of the software itself and of those predictions. But also this was a fluid situation. Things were changing all of the time. And so we also had to make the code more flexible. We had to make the code more extensible. We had no idea what was gonna come next or what mitigation was going to be needed or what the virus would do next. So the code had to be made able to do anything. The requirement was it should be able to do everything. Fun requirement to deal with. The other side was the statisticians over in the UQ for COVID project. They'd not used the code. They'd not seen the code but they had to do all of the uncertainty quantification, the statistical work, so they needed to learn how to use it. They needed to learn how to drive it and the science behind it, and they had to use it themselves. And not just use it, but they had to then plug that code into their statistical frameworks, their UQ pipelines, and so they had to make the code adaptable and connectable. Now we have problems. We had massive problems trying to meet these challenges. The main problem was time. There was little time at this you know, point in history to actually meet. We never met in person. You literally would have a meeting scheduled with the epidemiologist and you'd say, sorry, I had to cancel. I was talking to the prime minister. First time in my career I've had that. It's like, wow, I'm talking to someone who talked to the prime minister. Then I remembered who the prime minister was. <laughs> There was also little time to learn. You couldn't say, COVID, please stop. We all need to go and learn how all of this works and we'll come back a bit later. Not possible. The other side was that the annoying virus, it changed a lot. And this meant that the situation was fluid. You know, you had obviously variants later, but there were different ideas of what you needed to do with this. The requirements for the software continually in flux. It's like a new idea day after day after day. And so it's like, what development process could we use to actually make this work? This does not feel like agile, it's something weird. And what we recognized was the heart of this was documentation. We had this team of people and what we needed to make them all communicate with each other, bring them all onto the same page was really good documentation. The documentation to make sure that the epidemiologists could teach the statisticians how the code worked. The documentation that enabled us to work with the epidemiologist to say, this is how the code is now going to work. This is how you extend it. The documentation to enable us to talk to the uncertainty quantification group to say, this is how you plug it into your frameworks. The documentation was central because we couldn't talk to each other online synchronously. The documentation was the asynchronous communication that bound this project together. This led us to the realization, and I'm sure it's a realization many people have, and I, to be clear, I'm not claiming I've invented tutorial-driven development here, it's just something we kind of stumbled upon, but writing good documentation that describes how someone else 
can use the software and modify the software is just as important as writing the software itself. Which when I heard someone describe the Agile Manifesto, which was like, get the software out, documentation comes second, I was like, oh, crumbs. That's not how I work. The documentation is as important. And so what we did is we made the documentation. We built the documentation into the heart of actually building the software. And we built this wonderful set of documentation here. This is a tutorial. We realized the documentation was best described as a tutorial to lead someone through how to use the software, modify the software, develop the software. It's like in nine parts, in great detail, going from the very beginning of literally how do you install the software and turn it on and get started, assuming you know nothing, because literally I knew nothing, and the epidemiologists, so the UK people, they pretty much knew nothing, they knew more than me. All the way through to really advanced work for how you actually write your own plugins to model lockdowns and model regional variations and vaccines and everything else. And it wasn't just how you use the code, the tutorial also has the science. You know, this is the maths that's underpinning the model. This is how it works. This is what the parameters mean. This is the graphs. This is what these things mean together, all brought into one space. And because it was this one space, it meant that it was the place where we all met as a group, as a collaboration. Now, I'm sure now you have some questions. You know, I, I said at the beginning, like there was no time and the situation was fluid. So the first obvious question, is one, how did we know what documentation to write? You know, the second question is, how was there even time? You know, this was like a period of months. How was there even time to write such a detailed set of tutorials at the same time as writing the code, at the same time as doing the science and dealing with everything that was happening? And then the biggest question, how does the tutorial stay in sync with the code? You know, you're coding all the time, and I've had this experience before where I was writing a piece of documentation, then I'd write the code, and then the tutorial's out of date, or the documentation's out of date, and it's thrown away or it confuses people. And actually, the answer to these three questions was the driver towards tutorial-driven development. And because, you know, I've been told when I've presented this before during sort of the pandemic and when I was doing this on various online talks, they said, please, could you write it down somewhere? I thought, I'm empowered now, I can do this. I'm gonna turn the answer to these questions into a manifesto. <laughs> you need a manifesto, why not? So the manifesto is the answer to the questions. So the question is, how do you know what to write? Well, actually, the answer is kind of obvious. It's not writing, this is software, it is wonderful, and it has APIs, and this is how you use the API, because the API is great. No, what is the software going to be used for? Software is not a thing in and of itself. The software is used for an outcome. So your tutorial is there to basically focus on how you use the software to solve the goals that are representative for the users of that software and it's them who are you writing the tutorial for, and it's their goals that you need to solve. But how is their time? I flip this round, and I would say, if you're a user of a piece of software, and that, doc that functionality in that software is not documented, it's not in a tutorial, you don't know how to use it, or even if it exists, then that functionality was actually a waste of time for the programmer to write. From the user's point of view, undocumented software is non-existent software and you've wasted your time so actually writing the tutorial is making the software valuable that's why you have time to do it it's actually the thing you need to do and basically they don't know how to use it writing on documented software code is a waste of time and then finally how is it kept in sync again you flip this round it's not how do I keep the tutorial in sync with the code? It's how do I keep the code in sync with the tutorial? The tutorial is the single source of truth for how your code works. If you want to change the way the code works, you change the tutorial first to survive the new way of working, and then you change the code. What this means is for reproducibility, 
Your code by design is always going to reproduce the results in the tutorial. In terms of API stability, in terms of version control, you know, versioning and everything else, your tutorial is now describing the version of the software. Your software does what the tutorial says. The RON seal, it does what it says on the tin. Those ideals, and remembering the tutorial is a living document, you don't write the tutorial and then write the code and you never change the tutorial. It's always evolving and changing as everything is working. Those ideals lead you to the process. So this is the tutorial driven development process. You start off with a realization you need new features. The government wants regional lockdown, so we need to be able to have regional parameters that enable us to say what happens if these are a group of people in the north because they don't matter, they should be locked down for a long time, but these people in London will keep them not locked down for as long as possible. Something like that. <laughs> you discuss those features as part of the team. This is what we need to be able to do. And from the discussion of those new features, it's like, how do we want to do it? How should the code represent it? How in a tutorial would you access these features? And so you then write a tutorial of how the code could be used to model regional lockdowns. Once you've written the tutorial of how the code could be used to re model regional lockdowns, with the researchers, we're now all on the same page. We know what we need to do. As for RSEs, we can go, right, I've got my requirements now. I've got to make this tutorial work. And you write the code to implement the features. And once the tutorial runs, congratulations, it's working. Now, of course, when you've written those bits of code, you may have had to write new functionality or new units in your code. And of course, those are your tests. You need to write the unit tests in this to make sure those new units behave as possible but also your tutorial is kind of now the integration test for the new feature you've created. And so once the tutorial passes and the tutorial will sit there forever, you know you've done a good job. And what's more, I kind of treat the users of the software now, they are my distributed continuous integration platform. When they use the tutorial on the code on their own computers, if the tutorial fails, they tell me. It's not automated tested, it's kind of like you know, Mechanical Turk, Amazon kind of testing. But it's the real world, and so you get real world integration testing of what you've run. And you just keep going around this circle. Now obviously the real world is not as clean and wonderful as this describes, in the same way with Agile, it's not as clean and wonderful as you'd get from Agile. But, you know, generally you'll bounce backwards and forwards between stages. You'll be refining the sort of tutorial with the new features, then refining the code with the, feature, with the, new, the, code with the tutorials, etc. So you do tend to go around this. Does it work? Well, here is the tutorial we had. So you can see on sort of part four, this is a talking about a thing we needed to do to customize the output. We began writing the tutorial with them. And as we began writing it, we could then on the next version of the code, begin extending it and then writing the code that then made that work. And then we kept going by this time we now each part six has been written and then the code for part six was then written. And we keep going forward there. You can now see part eight is done and the code for part eight is done. And if you go on the website, you can actually watch the tutorial and the code evolve as you go through the various versions of the software. Until eventually, woohoo, we're modeling people going on holiday. That was quite a nice time. The thought that we could all go traveling again and then the disaster of realizing when we all came back from holiday, oh, there'd be another wave. It was fun times. I love the 2020s. <laughs> and of course it worked. You know, the question, did it all work? Of course it did. We. The main part of it working was this bottom sort of right here. This is the outputs that came from the inserted quantification group. And they were using the software in a really advanced way, pushing the limits of what it could do to do all of the type of UQ things they needed to do on their own outputs. The epidemiologists were massively happy. They could do everything they needed to do. We published a JOS paper. And this is where I finally wrote down in the JOS paper, which came out, I think, early this year or the end of last year just saying this is what tool driven development is. It's just really simple in terms of just like it's a paragraph of how it works. We've also begun using this on other projects. So using it on other projects, we've now taken it onto the SIA project. So this is basically an underpinning software for the Open Biosim Foundation, which I'll be talking about straight after lunch, which is the new way of funding software development and software maintenance if you're interested. But with the SIA platform, this is like a 20 year old code we had to refurbish and so to refurbish this, what we decided to do is to take tutorial driven development to write a whole new set of tutorials for this software. In writing those tutorials, 
you begin to realize how horrible that piece of software was to use as a user. It's like all these steps you had to put in just to get a molecule to load or to do some searching or everything else. And in writing the tutorials, it forced us to really think about improving the search functionality. So you see here, it's like, now we can just search for atoms and search for bonds. The other thing it kind of focused us doing was the old code, when you were printing stuff out, it just printed these massive lists on the screen and it was really horrible actually as a user to kind of like get any introspection. And so it's just doing things very simple. You can see here where we adjusted all of the print objects so that they basically cut the middles out. So you saw the first five and the last five of the list and now it prints to the screen. You do that once so the tutorial looks good on the screen and you haven't just printed a thousand lines of rubbish but also because now the code feels friendlier. And this is one reason, number one, why this is great. Your code is friendlier if you do this because you've written it for people to use. And that's a big difference with how we normally do software. You also spark ideas. When you're writing the tutorials, you go, oh, I've done this, but actually there's functionality I know exists in the code. And if I want to do this new thing, this new thing could actually use something we've got already. And we did a lot of this in MetaWards in the pandemic. It was not like we need this new thing and we're gonna create this whole new subsystem to do it. It was what do we have already that can be quickly repurposed in the tutorial to do what we want. And we got the same thing here. It's like we wanted to be able to just go over and find the sum of the mass of all of the oxygens. Well, actually that was just by adding an apply function to our lists. So then it's suddenly like, okay, it's easy now to describe it a tutorial, very easy to do in code, and suddenly there's this new additional powerful functionality that's very user-centric. How else do we use this? I now, within the Bristol RSE group, push tutorial-driven development as the primary means by which we do collaboration with our researchers. So when I do a new project with a researcher, go into that project and I say, okay, you want us to do new software on this or do new feature for that or do blah, blah, blah. And I say, can you please write a tutorial for the thing you want us to do? And the researcher then goes, yes, of course, I love talking about my work. I love showing you what to do because that's their passion. And they write a tutorial on what they wanted to do. And I say to them, don't worry about the code existing or not existing. Imagine if you had the perfect code that did what you wanted, write the tutorial as though your perfect code existed. And they write their tutorial. And that's what you see on the left here from an epidemiologist, no, sorry, for someone who does uh, gene-wide association studies on the left. That tutorial then is written in co-coding sessions where we have the RSC as well. The RSC can see the tutorial being developed. They learn the domain knowledge of the project they're working on from this tutorial, because remember it includes the science. And then their job is to write the software that makes the tutorial work, which they go and do. And it's really nice because then the tutorial becomes our marker of progress. It becomes the focus of all of our co-coding meetings. Suddenly code review is not me and the RSC doing our magic while the PI is off somewhere else going, I don't want to do technical stuff. Code review is tutorial review, where we sit as a group around the tutorial and we go, how is it working? Does that make sense? Does this API look good? Does this make like logical sense? And that the PI is involved, it's us as a team. You hear me talk constantly about us being a partnership and not as a service. This is how we're a partnership. And I said, you get the domain knowledge transfer, et cetera. And then just to kind of finish up, what are the tools? You need tools when you have a manifesto. Well, anything you can publish on. So we use GitHub Pages a lot. We use our Markdown, because I love R. R and R Markdown. I wish people used our Markdown notebooks instead of Jupyter notebooks, just as a quick push. And we use Sphinx. Our Markdown notebooks can do C++ and Python. They are fantastic, but anyway. Now, why is it great? I, I'm trying to convince you now for the exclamation mark. I hope I've got you to great full stop. I want great exclamation mark now. Traditional programming methods kind of view the world as divided into two groups, your developers and your users. And generally they're kept apart. And you'll go to the user occasionally and they'll somehow smuggle to you a contract of requirements. And then the developers will do their magic and then eventually some software will come out that they hand back and woo, the requirements are met. Congratulations, you have software, it's a girl. Now, 
that's okay for software engineering and I'm not attacking this way of working. You know, if this is what you do, that's fine for you. But for research software engineering, I think this model of the world is not right. I don't think that research software at a deep level has clear requirements. At least I've never met a research project where they've come to me and said, I want you to design X, Y, Z with clear requirements. It's continually evolving through the research process. Equally, the members of the research team, and us RSEs are a member of a research team with the PDRAs and the post, you know, PhDs and the PIs, etc. We don't neatly divide into developers and users. There's actually a full spectrum from your pure developers who just do code to your pure users who will never program no matter how much you tell them it's a great deal of fun through your user developers who just want to do some scripting or just want to do little changes. And particularly now because research is so flexible, you need to have frameworks and you're sort of developing the scripts as frameworks. And good documentation is the glue that binds this entire group together. I think as was mentioned um, in this morning's keynote, good documentation is how you take your users and they learn how to go into the community and they learn how to use the software and they can choose the level of engagement that they want to work with. It binds you together, it provides the center by which you can communicate with each other and it provides the welcoming, inclusive, team-based partnership that I think makes research software development much more fun and engaging than requirements-driven pure software engineering. With that, there is the manifesto, and I think it's time possibly for questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Um, do, do we have the slider? OK, we've got a lot of questions already. OK, let's start with the top one. Um, so at, at the stage when the tutorial for a feature is written but not yet implemented, how do you make sure you don't confuse your users? That's a very, very good question. And this is where tutorial-driven development is that partnership with the user community. So either the direct PI, if you're the direct PI, or with the sort of user community you're working with. If you're working as, as was MetaWards or in PI-driven projects, they're writing the tutorial with you. So they're not confused that they've written the tutorial and the code isn't there yet. You know, it's all driven from that tutorial. It's like you're describing what will eventually be ready for me rather than something that doesn't work yet. It's the promise of what's coming. For community projects, so in SIA, which has got a much larger range of users, the tutorial-driven development is in your feature branch. And of course, the main documentation, of course, is built off your main branch, and it won't include the new tutorial-driven parts until it gets merged in as part of a pull request. So again, it's this evolution, but the tutorial comes, and when you pull request, the tutorial and the feature obviously come together, but as a user community, you can always see what the developers are working on. It also opens up the whole milestones and everything, because now instead of the users going, I don't know what's coming next, and bang, suddenly a new feature appears, and you look at the API and work out what's going on, your user community is now seeing this evolving tutorial, and they go, wow, I can do that in n months' time or n weeks' time. And then they start giving you suggestions, and they go, well, it looks really good I can do that, but could I do this as well? And it becomes a discussion point, and you're talking at the language of the user not the language of the code of the developer. So, yeah, sorry. Okay, um, next question. Um, oh, one's just overtaken. Um, what's the difference between tutorial-driven development and literate programming by Donald Kunt? Again, so, so I'm saying I'm not inventing anything. I think there's probably this, people have done this. Literate programming, I think, is part of the inspiration. So literate programming is obviously where you're writing the code and the documentation all in one go, but that's something you tend to do as an individual. You're describing your code as you work through. It's not a development process. In this case, tutorial-driven development is the tutorials are coming from your user community with you as a partnership, and then you write the code to do it. And actually, if you saw the tutorials on the screen, they were not notebooks. So people who do literate programming tend to end up writing notebooks where people just go shift enter, shift enter, shift enter, shift enter all the way through. These are tutorials, they're pages of text the actual code in there is in code blocks with their outputs, but they're not like a run this to get this output. It's a, this is how this works. This is how you'll do this to do that, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's proper documentation. 
Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, so what is the overlap between tutorial driven development and user experience design? I think that's a fantastic question and I think there must be massive overlap and I would love to talk to people who are in user experience because I think, and just from my experience, I think research software engineering, we tend not to go into the full UI side and actually thinking about how people use software because we're very much concentrated on meeting the goals of today. But I think there's probably this whole field of overlap where you can start thinking about how you can use the tutorials to model ways of using the software before the software physically exists. And I think there's probably this, like, huge overlap and I'd be very happy to talk to people who are in that space. Because again, how you would do this with graphical programs, I don't know. You know, this has worked for the things we've done, but these are like big research software projects where you're running a piece of code to do a simulation or something else. How this would operate for a website or a web app or something like that, that I'd love to sort of talk to people about how you could adapt it for those kind of scenarios. Okay, great. Um, yeah, lots more discussion points, but we'll leave it there um, and maybe you can catch each other at lunch. Uh, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.